As exemplified by the recent instance of a Melbourne couple crossing the Queensland border despite their home city being under lockdown, do you think the average Australian has become COVID complacent because the ongoing pandemic is no longer something that the majority experience in their day-to-day -day lives? And do you think that this complacency is being fueled by the Scott Morrison government's notably slow vaccine rollout? Peter Harcher. Well, Tilly, I'd say that uh, Australians have got pretty comfortable. We've been pretty privileged uh, to be able to pretty much, uh, Melbourne accept, Victoria accepted, um, particularly pretty much live lives as normal with the exception of international contacts, of course. And I think the combination of uh, that fortunate position that uh, we find ourselves in because of the rigorous early public health response has not only made us all feel pretty comfortable with our lives, uh, but it has injected a sort of sluggishness, I think, in the, into the, some of the rates of take-up of vaccinations, and we saw how quickly that changed when there was the latest scare in Victoria, a, a surge of people getting vaccination. But the real, the real uh, complacency, I would suggest, um, comes from the top. We saw, you know, credit where it's due, the initial response, I think the public health response and the economic stimulus um, was exemplary, was textbook stuff. But when that first wave uh, of emergency and crisis faded, I think what we saw was um, the return to the, Australia's greatest enemy, uh, our natural complacency. So, uh, and as a function of that, because of the, the slowness of the vaccine uh, rollout, the inability to move away from a, a flawed system of hotel quarantine, We've seen the states impatient uh, stepping up increasingly to take over from the federal government tasks that the federal government had been doing. So um, I, I, think we, I think we've been comfortable and the government has been complacent. Cameron Murray, um, is complacency the word you would use? Uh, I think people are right to be complacent because I think compared to what we see in the media, uh, I think people have a better judge of the risks than what we've seen in the media. And uh, from a public health perspective, it's, it's not clear to me that any of our reactions have been ideal. I've read the pandemic plans from prior to 2020, and most of what we've done, we're not in them. School closures were not recommended. Um, work, working from home, not recommended. Border closures, not recommended. Um, we know this, um, this virus is a thousand times worse for elderly people than the young, and we don't need to vaccinate 100% of the young people before we open up. That's just uh, an imbalance of risks. Cameron, That's are, you, just... are, you, are you seriously suggesting that uh, COVID doesn't affect young people or, or that our no. border closures haven't, been, haven't made us almost the most successful country in the world when it's come to managing this pandemic? Do you think we've been the most successful? I think we've been extraordinarily successful. In what you, measure? You, you, you look at the number of people who've actually in died In all public health, COVID. in all public health, in all the delayed births, all those couples who will never have the children they want because they, uh, hospitals were delayed, they were, they were scared of the pandemic, all those routine health checks that got delayed that we can't catch up on, you, you think that they outweigh the risks I'm sorry, and justify. Cameron, but <laughs> if you look at the data from every country that didn't do those things, all of that happened, plus a lot of people died of COVID. How many? So, How many? So, How many? Um, but, I, you know, I, I've talked... But let's be serious. Stan You're sitting here saying we should vaccinate 100% of people before we open borders. I, we know, <laughs> or some large portion, and we're talking about making this compulsory when we know that children have extremely low risks. We know that schools were open for the 18 months in Sweden and no children died. Like, this seems to me like a complete imbalance and a, and a sort of rejection of public health messaging of maximising total health and total well-being. Can, can do, I speak as a public health expert um, yeah. and not an economist? I think well, that... <laughs> so, what we are aiming for is a level of vaccine coverage that means yeah. we are not going to get to high levels of transmission and yep. be constantly uh, so, so what is that? following our towel. If you look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, they have almost 50% coverage and they started to open up.
They opened up to other countries in Europe. They've now had to close to Portugal. Their Prime Minister, their, uh, their uh, Secretary of um, Economic, the Treasury, has said we may need to delay opening up because we've got a new yeah. variant, we've got an increase in hospitalizations, we've got an increased number of cases. So I think waiting a few months to get to a level of vaccine coverage where we know we can control mm -hmm. this disease mm -hmm. without stringent measures, it just is a no-brainer. Mm. And one of the things I've, I've really had issues with during this pandemic is people without the appropriate expertise making commentary. Our public, our I public just... I trust, no far more than many of the other experts who I've can, seen on can, TV. Can, I can, I just, can you, can you I hold, hold the thoughts for a moment, Cameron, because yeah. it does lead to our next question. I do want to come okay. back in and pick this up with you, but Annabelle Howard will, will uh, I think also, is looking at this issue about just how seriously we should take this. I'm originally from Sydney and moved to Canberra just before COVID hit last year. And living in Canberra, there hasn't been a COVID case in around a year. Do you agree with the belief that Australia's COVID precautions have been overly cautious? Okay, I'll, I'll go to camera. <laughs> well, I mean, firstly, I don't appreciate the, the, the you know, academic barbs about specialties because I know you're, you routinely comment on, on economic policy issues. But, <laughs> like, you're all clapping for her. I think we should be fair about this. Um, but, look, I've read the pandemic response plans. Now, either we were wrong prior to 2020, and we made ridiculous plans, or we're wrong now. We can't both be right. Was the point here, Cameron, that it was, some, it was novel, it was changing, even now we're seeing new strains coming in, so that's, this is something we've had to respond viruses. to in, I, real, I, in real time. I'll see from Cameron we, and then th Cameron. This is true and predictable, and I, I, I wrote six months ago that this virus will mutate, we will see new strains and we'll find reasons to panic again. And this was known, correct, that this would happen. We have medical experts who would have known this. So, you know, I, I think we, we're more than a year into this. We have thousands of Australians who can't cross the border and come home. We're closing down routinely our normal health services. And I think it's time to ask questions about the balance of risk and reward from the response we've oh, had. Oh, could I just, you know, just pick up on something yep. um, Cameron said there and go to you, Cameron on this. This has been a very emotional time, understandably, and you see deaths and you look overseas and you see what's happening in places like India. Um, we see new variants. It is something we don't know a lot about and we're collecting data on the run. But I'm just wondering whether, and I think this is something that Cameron and others have raised, whether the response is driven more by the fear or the reality of the numbers? It's driven by the rea reality of the disease, Dan. So what we know is that uh, one case can go to an uncontrollable uh, outbreak. And so at the moment, we do not have enough people vaccinated to be confident that we can allow the disease to spread without it getting to a point where we Ooh. need to lock down. And what we have experienced again and again, and what every country that has had transmission has experienced, is this rolling lockdowns. And if you think about places like Europe, places like the US, developed wealthy countries, that's been their experience for the last year and a half in and out of lockdown. Now, we have the way out. We have high vaccine coverage. And I think that just to, it's almost an argument that, um, you know, people, are, Australians are not getting vaccinated because they haven't experienced the horrors of an overwhelming pandemic, overflowing hospitals, overflowing cemeteries. So perhaps we've failed. We've succeeded. We're well ahead of mm. everybody else. 